Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Academic Job Application Review, or the AJAR, program for graduate students and postdoctoral researchers. Uh, so this is a new program being provided by the Student Services Committee of AESP, uh, with a goal of showcasing some of our outstanding graduate students, some of our outstanding postdoctoral scholars, uh, and a program that's meant to be reflective of the, the great diversity across our discipline. Uh, to give all of these individuals uh, an opportunity for some preparatory experience for academic job interviews. Uh, so across the series, we will have 16 graduate students and postdocs. Uh, they'll give a research talk like the session we have today, and we'll conduct mock interviews with a search committee and mock interviews with a senior faculty member. So kind of a really in-depth experience. So you, you get to uh, see what the academic job market is, is like before you're sitting there in your first interview. Um, we're very fortunate today. Today we have two, uh, two presenters and it is my honor to introduce the first one. So Dr. Lou Leyu uh, earned her PhD from the University of Maryland and completed a postdoc at Rice University. She is currently a research associate at the Houston Advanced Research Center and her research focuses on the water energy climate nexus integrated human natural systems modeling and urban water sustainability. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, Dr. Leo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my great honor to talk to you today about my research. So uh, my research passion lies in addressing questions at the intersect of water, energy, and climate systems. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work, uh, Thirst for Water and Power, Technology-Enabled Solutions Emanated from a Deep Dive into the Water Energy Climate Nexus. Okay, so we know that water and energy are two important resources we humans rely on uh, to survive uh, and build our civilization. Oh, I think my slide is buffering for some reason. Sorry, I'm trying to load the animation. Okay, there we go. Um, and we build engineering systems like these uh, to harness water and energy from nature and make them work towards our needs. And these infrastructures are important to our economy, uh, national security and public health. Water and energy infrastructure designed in the past, however, uh, were built without considering the interconnections between the two systems. But we also know that water and energy systems are interconnected, interdependent, and intertwined. So the two systems are connected through important physical processes. Uh, for example, water is used for energy production. About 38% of the total freshwater withdrawal in the US is for power plant cooling in order to generate electricity. This is a substantial amount of water since over one third of the freshwater is used to produce electricity alone. Energy um, is also used for water treatment, uh, purification, delivery, and conveyance. This amount of energy accounts for uh, less than 2% of the total primary energy consumption in the US. However, this percentage varies greatly across states. For example, uh, in the state of California, energy for water services is almost 20% of the state's total energy production because the state uh, relies heavily on aqueducts for water conveyance. And because of the interconnections and the interdependencies between the two systems, constraints posed on one system will propagate to the other system. Uh, for example, uh, a prolonged droughts can cause a low water level and reservoirs, which can lead to reduced hydroelectric power production from dams. So a problem initially started as a water scarcity can potentially become a, a power scarcity issue. And furthermore, environmental change uh, and the socioeconomic drivers are making the uh, water energy system more vulnerable. The animation is loading, but it's buffering. Um, so population growth and urbanization are driving up the demand, oh, sorry, are driving up the demand for uh, uh, water and energy by 2050, more than two thirds of the world's population will live in urban areas and, um, and the, the strain on water and the energy systems will be further aggravated. And climate change adds another le uh, level of uncertainty 
to our future demand and supply of these resources because climate greatly affects how we manage these systems. Our engineering systems are also aging fast, uh, leading to decreased supply reliability and increased maintenance cost, which is further exacerbated by the lack of sustainable financial resources. So if you do a quick search online, you can find many news articles related to infrastructure failures uh, due to failures of uh, uh, interconnected systems. So it's becoming more and more common to see water and energy systems at risk. And such risks are exacerbated by global environmental change and the socioeconomic pressures. So my research will take a deep dive into the water energy climate nexus with quantitative modeling approach to improve our understanding of the system dynamics. Then I will find technology uh, enable solutions to resolve some critical conflicts at the water energy climate nexus with the objective to inform sustainable water and energy system planning. So uh, without further ado, let's begin. First, let's uh, look at some basics about physical constraints on the uh, energy system. So this, uh, the top left figure is a typical thermoelectric power plant with one through cooling system. So this type of power plant is the most common power plant worldwide. 83% of the US power demand comes from thermoelectric power generation. And 43% of these power plants are equipped with one through cooling systems. With one through cooling system, uh, cooling water is extracted from the inlet, goes through the power plant, absorbs the exhaust heat from combustion engines, and is discharged back to the river at the outlet. The discharged water is usually several degrees warmer than the water at the inlet. So if there uh, is a sufficient water in the river or the incoming water is too hot, then the efficiency of heat removal can be severely reduced. The outgoing water temperature is constrained by environmental regulations uh, that preserve ecosystem integrity. So if the outlet water temperature exceeds the environmental thresholds, the power plant has to uh, dial back and reduce production to comply. Uh, this map shows that between 2006 and 2012, 27 power plants in the US experienced curtailments due to heat or, uh, or droughts. And uh, some of these curtailments are directly caused by compliance to environmental regulations on thermal discharge. And climate change as another constraint by increasing air and water temperature and a shift in the paradigm of water resources. This left figure here shows how climate change exacerbates heat wave globally. The increasing warmer temperature and the longer heat wave will propagate to affect water availability as well as water temperature. Uh, which will further constrain our power system. And climate change also intensifies regional water scarcity and shifts water resources paradigm. We can see from this right figure that some parts of the world are uh, anticipated to experience more severe water scarcity. And this will likely put a, a strain on the power system. So there is an urgent need to understand the vulnerability of power system under climate change. To address this challenge, I developed uh, an integrated modeling framework to quantify climate change impacts on US thermoelectric usable capacity. So usable capacity is the maximum electric output an electricity generator can produce under specific conditions. So I coupled a thermoelectric power generation model with a community land model, which provides water av uh, availability and water temperature uh, input for the power generation model. The community land model is driven by climate forcings generated by uh, earth system models. The state level representation of uh, environmental regulation on discharge, um, um, sorry, <clears throat> has not been considered by, uh, by previous research. So my study filled this gap by uh, incorporating the 50 state environmental regulations as a constraint 
uh, in the thermoelectric generation uh, power generation model. The model reason individual power plant data and presents the result at an aggregated level. So key advancement of this approach from the previous literature is that we included an explicit representation of the state level environmental regulation on thermal discharge. And this has shown to have non-trivial impact on the results. So this map here shows the state disaggregated environmental regulations on thermal discharge. Uh, these regulations are uh, in place to protect ecosystem health and, uh, and to preserve ecosystem integrity uh, because thermal pollution can damage aquatic ecosystems. So the underlying color here on the map is the maximum discharge water temperature. So you can see that most of the states have a temperature thresholds around 32 degrees Celsius, which is about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the states in the south, uh, south have a higher threshold than the states in the north. And the dots uh, on top of the, uh, the color suggest the degree to which power plants can discharge water hotter than the maximum threshold. So you see that majority of the states would allow a 2.5 to 3 degree of exceedance once the stringent threshold is violated. And such exceedance needs approval from local regulatory offices. This figure on the right shows the impact of climate change and the regulatory constraint on uh, existing power plants usable capacity in the US. So we projected usable capacity for three future time periods, 2030s, 2060s, and 2090s. So the y-axis shows the change of usable capacity compared to historical period. The red and blue bars uh, indicate the two climate change scenarios with the blue bar being warmer than the, the, the red bar. And the, the, bright, the brighter color bars are uh, for stringent re regulatory constraint and the darker uh, color bars are for the relaxed regulatory constraint. So with stringent regulatory constraint, we can see that uh, eight to 14% of the reduction in usable capacity will be expected. And this is caused by the combined effect of climate change and the regulatory constraint. Uh, however, if permissions are granted to alleviate the, uh, the stringent constraint, which means that the environmental regulations are relaxed, then less than 3% of the usable capacity would be um, impacted. And these are uh, reductions are mainly caused by climate variability. So between the two climate change scenarios, we can see that the negative impact is stronger if climate gets warmer because the blue bars always outweigh the red bars. And between the two regulatory uh, scenarios, we can see that the negative impact on usable capacity is, is much less under the relaxed uh, regulatory constraint, meaning that climate change may not be the main driver of user, uh, usable capacity loss. Here is another figure showing the impact of climate change and the regulatory constraint on usable capacity over the course of a year. So the black line here is for historical period. The dashed color lines are uh, under stringent regulatory constraints and the solid color lines are with relax, uh, relaxed constraints. Uh, so regardless of which scenarios, it's clear that the reduction of usable capacity is most significant during summer month when uh, water and air temperatures are high and the stream flow is low. The difference between the black line and the dashed line is the result of combined effect of climate change and the regulatory constraint. And the difference between the black line and the solid lines is mainly driven by climate change. So we can see that climate change will affect power plant usable capacity but regulatory constraints may have a stronger negative impact than climate change. Uh, therefore, the main conclusion from this study is that compliance to environmental regulation plays a very important role mm -hmm. in power system reliability. In addition to um, water temperature, water availability is also uh, critical to the reliability of power generation because our uh, current electricity generation relies heavily on freshwater resources. The US is 
uh, very coal dominant for its electricity production before the year uh, 2010. And, and after that, natural gas and renewable energies take up a bigger share in, this, uh, in the portfolio. Current US uh, thermoelectric power of freshwater withdrawal is about 161 cubic kilometers per year. This number will change if we have a different generation portfolio because water use intensities uh, vary greatly across fuel and the technology. Conventional fossil fuel-based technologies and one through cooling technologies, uh, as we mentioned earlier, are very water intensive uh, in terms of uh, water use per unit electricity generated. Renewable energies, however, have very little water footprint. And in addition, freshwater resources is disproportionately distributed in the US with the Eastern part having more water available for electricity generation than the Western part. So understanding how future energy system will evolve under a water constrained world is very important to the reliability of uh, future power production. So to understand how US energy system might evolve under water constraint, I conducted a scenario based analysis with an integrated assessment model uh, that has a 50 state uh, representation of the energy system. Uh, this model is called GCAM USA. So GCAM has been used for decades to understand the dynamics of the coupled human earth system and the response of the system to global changes. So in GCAM USA, we have climate, land use, uh, energy, economy, and water systems. And they are physically in, uh, linked to each other through robust coupling. In this research, I built a response mechanism between water supply and energy supply, which uh, was a missing link in the previous GCAM USA. And I examined the impact of limited water supply on future energy, uh, future electricity capacity expansion. So key advancement of this study from uh, previous literature is that GCAM USA allows uh, us to integrate both supply and demand effects under a consistent framework, uh, which means that demand uh, into the future is not fixed, but changes with the future socioeconomic projections. So this top figure here shows the impact of water constraints on new electricity capacity installment under the three water constraint scenarios. Uh, the Y axis shows the change from no water constraint. And it's clear that with uh, water constraint, we would have more investment in wind and the solar technologies, which uh, are considered uh, 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 non-water dependent uh, technologies. We would uh, reduce investment in gas-based technologies. And the, the more constrained we are, the more uh, we invest in renewables and divest in gas. So you might wonder, uh, is a natural gas considered a clean fuel for uh, power generation? Uh, yes, the statement is true from a greenhouse gas emission perspective, because natural gas power plant emits uh, uh, 50 to uh, emits 50 to 60 percent less of CO2 than a coal power plant. But uh, natural gas power plant still requires water for cooling. But renewable energies such as solar and wind do not need water to generate power. So in a world where water resources is severely limited, investing in renewables becomes the economic viable solution. This bottom figure here shows the impact of water constraint on forced retired capacity. The, the reason why we have a forced retirement of existing capacity is because these capacities become economic not viable given limited water supply and it is better to retire them before the, the end of their design lifetime. So we can see that under severe water constraint scenario, we have more forced <coughs> retirement. And these forced retirements are mostly steam engine, coal, and gas fire technologies because they are considered water intensive. So in general, the impact is more pronounced as water constraint becomes more stringent. And all of these effects are driven by economic considerations decided by the GCAM USA model. This map here shows where forced retirements would happen under the severe water constraint scenario. So you see that there are four states that are most impacted. 
these are Texas, Arizona, California, and Florida. So these places are typically considered water scarce uh, states and the associated economic costs with these forced retirements are not trivial, uh, which is indicated by the red color here. Uh, it is estimated that the economic cost associated with adapting to severe water constraint is about 0.2% of US GDP in 2050, which is equivalent to the share of GDP uh, by the entire state of Wyoming. Uh, it's also noteworthy that most of these forced retirements would happen in the Western US because water is binding electricity generation in these places. So uh, from here uh, on, uh, we can tell that uh, it is very important to incorporate water constraint in electricity capacity expansion because uh, it will completely change how we generate electricity and it, uh, and, uh, it will also have a uh, very strong economic implications. So uh, these previous studies quantitatively characterizes the uh, interconnections among water, energy, and climate systems, and reveals some conflicts among these different objectives. Um, then uh, I looked at how we can develop solutions to resolve some uh, critical conflicts at the water energy climate nexus. One possible solution is to augment water supply, not by building more dams or water storages, but with technology enabled water reuse. So uh, most of the urban centers today still rely on a centralized distribution system. So source water is treated at a, a centralized facility and distributed to each user through a massive distribution network. A centralized system has proven to be cost effective and reliable but it also has many issues like uh, being energy intensive uh, and it also has a uh, deteriorating water quality issue in aging pipelines. It is, it is also susceptible to uh, natural hazards given its large scale. Uh, and also it's financially out of reach for underdeveloped communities. So there is an increasing need to reuse wastewater to minimize freshwater use. But what is the best way to uh, reuse wastewater while minimizing cost and energy consumption. A hybrid system design, uh, as shown here, presents new opportunity to resolve some of these uh, issues uh, in a centralized system. So as the figure shows, this is a hybrid system where centralized water supply is supplemented by distributed pipe uh, supplies from wastewater reuse. So instead of completely relying on the central uh, facility for water supply, Modular facilities that treat wastewater are set up close to points of production and wastewater treated to potable or non-potable standards is reused at site. So with this uh, system design, energy conveyance need is reduced and water quality deterioration is minimized during delivery. However, current literature on distributed water reuse remains qualitative. Uh, qualitative. We understand the many benefits uh, a distributed water reuse system may bring but we don't quantitatively understand the economic and environmental implications of such system design. So we urgently need quantitative analytical tools and databases to help us characterize uh, and build uh, and design hybrids or distributed water uh, system. Um, so let me introduce our vision of a hybrid water system with direct potable reuse. Uh, in this system, we have a centralized water facility providing drinking water through uh, drinking water distribution network. And we also have a distributed wastewater reuse system composed of nine wastewater treatment plants uh, that supplements drinking water supply. We assume that 50% of the wastewater collected at the wastewater treatment plants uh, is treated to potable standards and pumped right back into the city's drinking water network. This is a direct potable reuse process. And the remaining 50% uh, follows the conventional approach uh, to be discharged back to the natural water bodies. So in this system design, uh, part of the water demand is met by uh, reclaimed wastewater and the rest is still <coughs> met by conventional drinking water. So, <clears throat> and with direct potable reuse, there's no need for a separate piping system because we use existing drinking water pipelines to deliver recycled water. The reason why we use direct potable reuse is that uh, building separate pipelines, uh, pipelines for reclaimed water can quickly drive up the total cost and applying direct potable reuse can avoid such capital investment from the beginning. 
So uh, I, I know that some of you understand how DPR works, but just to give you a brief introduction, uh, municipal wastewater collected at wastewater treatment plant usually go through a train of processes to remove contaminants. Um, uh, and in DPR, wastewater effluent out of the secondary treatment is treated to potable standards by advanced treatment technologies, uh, uh, which is shown here. The process is um, uh, is adopted from a pilot DPR facility in El Paso, Texas. Uh, it starts with the membrane filtration and then reverse osmosis, UV processes, uh, granular activated carbon. So we conduct our, uh, our analysis on the city of Houston's water system because of uh, it's a big, given its massive drinking water network uh, serving a large population. Uh, note that there are three surface water purification plants they're all located on the east side of the city. And the city has 39 wastewater treatment plants identified by the green triangles here. And these wastewater treatment plants can all potentially provide reclaimed water and become part of the distributed water system. So we built our study on a tool called EPNet, which is an application for modeling drinking water distribution systems. We feed uh, nine wastewater, wastewater treatment plants data and the water distribution network data into our system design. And we came up with 512 system configurations based on a simple combination calculation of allowing X number of wastewater treatment plants treating water, uh, wastewater to potable standards. And this will give us all possible uh, combinations of system configurations given nine wastewater treatment plants. And considering the multiple factors that affect reclaimed water entry point, we ran EPNet under the 512 system configurations and measured uh, the four performance uh, metrics as an evaluation of the environmental economic impact. So what's unique about this study is that we are the first of its kind to comprehensively assess the impact of integrating existing urban water and wastewater infrastructure through DPR uh, uh, and with exhaustive system configuration. So let's quickly look at some results. Uh, previous studies hypothesized that distributed system might shorten water residence time, but there has been very little quantitative assessment to support that hypothesis. This figure here shows how distributed DPR would impact water age, uh, aka water residence time. So the longer the water age, the worse uh, water quality it may get. So in a way, water age is an indicator of water quality. So in this figure, we show that the density uh, show the density of end users water age between the centralized and hybrid system. You can see that the median water age is reduced by about two hours in a hybrid system. Uh, in particular for these users in the red box that have long water age to begin with. Um, and this figure on the right shows where these reduced water age might occur in the system. So each dot here is, an, uh, is a water end user. The, the yellow triangle is the wastewater treatment plant. The blue color means decreased water age. So it's clear that these communities around the wastewater treatment plant see a decrease in their water age. And this is because now they receive part of their wa water supply directly from the wastewater treatment plants instead of relying on the three surface water uh, purification plants located on the east side of the city. So with that, we show that there's a, a potential improvement uh, uh, in water quality with distributed DPR. Here's another figure showing how distributed DPR affect overall financial cost, energy consumption, and water supply. Uh, allow me to walk you through this uh, chart here. So each dot here is one system configuration. The centralized system, which is shown here, uh, is the red dot, uh, the AKA no water reuse scenario. The x-axis shows the difference of electric energy consumption between each DPR scenario and the status quo. And the y-axis shows the additional financial cost needed to implement each DPR. And the colors indicate the percentage of reclaimed water as a fraction of total water supply. So uh, <coughs> first, let's look at the electricity energy consumption. So obviously, these DPR scenarios uh, in the back, black box have an overall uh, less energy requirement compared to the other system configurations. Uh, the reason why this is happening, uh, there, there are two moving parts here. First, uh, treating wastewater to potable standards will require a lot of energy. Uh, and second, 
freshwater supply is reduced and therefore less pumping treatment and delivery energy is required for freshwater supply. And for these configurations, the energy reduction from freshwater supply outweighs the energy consumption in uh, water reuse. So therefore the energy balance uh, at the system level becomes negative. This is very interesting because we normally think that advanced treatment technologies that bring wastewater to potable standards are very energy intensive, but we show that with proper system design and configuration, implementing distributed DPR does not necessarily drive up total energy consumption. Uh, in fact, uh, these, tech, uh, these configurations, which account for 8.8% uh, of all configurations, display a potential to save overall energy balance. Another observation I'd like to point out is that with full implementation of DPR, we can actually supplement freshwater supply by up to 28%. So, that, uh, so this means that 28% of the city's water demand can be met by recycled water. And lastly, we find out that the unit operational and management cost to implement DPR is less than 50 cents per cubic meter. Uh, it's still more expensive than conventional water treatment or wastewater treatment, but compared to other unconventional water supply, such as uh, uh, seawater desalination, it is cost uh, competitive. So with this study, we show that a hybrid system with distributed DPR renders the potential to achieve multiple economic and environmental objectives. So one last uh, result. In the previous slide, we assumed the energy intensity of advanced treatment is 1.5 uh, kilowatt hour per cubic meter. So this number here uh, lies in the middle of the literature review. So what would happen if we change the energy intensity of advanced treatment uh, technology? What would uh, that mean to uh, the total energy consumption at the system level. This graph here shows the fraction of configurations achieving net energy saving with respect to energy intensity of advanced treatment. So uh, here's the 1.5. Uh, it allows 8.8% of the configuration achieving net energy saving. And we can see that if the uh, energy intensity is less than 1.15, that all configurations can achieve net energy saving. If uh, it exceeds 1.73, then no configuration can achieve net energy saving. So with this modeling tool, we can explore the technology space we need to be in, in order to achieve environmental and economic objectives. So this tool presents the potential to facilitate future technology development and system design. So coming back to this diagram I showed at the beginning, uh, we, uh, my research aimed at understanding the interdependencies and trade-offs among uh, water and energy economy systems and finding technology-enabled solutions to inform sustainable water and energy system planning. So I made a deep dive into the water and energy climate nexus, and we found that power generation is a power generation system is vulnerable to climate-induced water uh, variability, and energy system planning is constrained by water availability and there is an increasing need to sustainably augment water supply. Then I presented an unconventional water augmentation solution, distributed DPR, and we show that the distributed DPR enables financially competitive and environmentally ad advantageous system design. So with my research, I provided quantitative modeling tools and databases to facilitate future system planning and next generation technology development. And lastly, uh, uh, great research comes from great teams. I'd like to thank my collaborators uh, for their hard work and tremendous support over the years. Uh, they come from many different institutes and are there uh, and, uh, and a diverse background. I also like to thank my funding agencies for supporting my research. So uh, with that, I will end my talk and open the floor for questions and comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Leu. It, it was a, a fascinating talk with um, an incredible uh, breadth and depth of, of content. Um, we, we have uh, a little bit of time after the top of the hour. So we're going to keep the, the Zoom open until, until quarter past. So in the interest of getting our second speaker going, we're going to save the questions to the end. Okay, okay? yeah. Right, Sorry so th for taking up the time. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you did. You did. Uh, it was a nice time, but we were going to make sure that we um, use the second half for our second speaker. So thank sure. you. And so I'll, I'll hand over uh, the mic 
to, uh, to Lucia Rodriguez, who will introduce our second speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lulio. It was an excellent talk. Uh, I'm pretty sure we'll have plenty of questions after, after the talk, but now is the time for Dr. Reinaldo Alcalde. Uh, Ray, who will be uh, presenting his work. He is currently a postdoctoral scholar at Caltech. Uh, he received his bachelor's in civil engineering from uh, University of Nebraska, Lincoln. And he went and received his master's in environmental engineering from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign Urbana and his PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, his work that he's going to talk in deep about, about it is in um, the microbial interactions with uh, pollutants and using microfluidics that is, uh, um, it's very interesting. And he has received several awards, but I want to also mention his outreach activities because it's very impressive. He has participated in the Clubes de Ciencia that, and I just took a look to learn a, a little bit more about them. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization that organized um, workshops for uh, STEAM workshops in, uh, from kids in developing countries at no cost, but he's also the co-director of the Clean Water Science Network, also nonprofit organizations that uh, the objective is empower community members to improve their, um, their health and quality of life, especially in water and sanitation projects. So uh, that's a very impressive work uh, that I don't know if he's going to you have time to mention that I think that is worth uh, uh, is worth commenting on, on his effort. And with that, I will let him talk about his research. And thank you. Ray, you, want, you. might want to switch your view to. Uh, is it on the wrong? Okay, here we go. Yeah. Is is this right? Does this work? Okay, Lucia, thank you so much. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, so today, I I want to talk to you about tell you a story about my dissertation work. Uh, I just graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in December and currently starting a postdoc position here uh, at Caltech. The presentation today uh, is titled Microfluidics for Modeling Antibi Antimicrobial Resistance. And this is somewhat of a general title. And I hope as we go through this presentation, you'll see that my interests are really in understanding microbial response to spatial antibiotic concentration gradients in the presence uh, under nitrate reduction, under nitrate reducing conditions. So uh, this background image here for the sake of time, I'm not gonna explain it, I'm gonna leave it a little mystery, but I think as we go through it, uh, it'll be very obvious what it is. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna start here. If I can change the slides, okay. So what is the problem? I'm, really interested in understanding antibiotic pollution in the environment. Antibiotic pollution in the environment is quite diverse. The sources vary considerably and the inputs can vary also drastically. Uh, for example, on the top left side, this is uh, effluent from a wastewater treatment plant. Typically the concentrations we see here can be relatively low, but they persist. Wastewater treatment plants aren't designed to remove antibiotics from the environment. But these concentrations can vary regionally, geographically, and also from the sources, whether it's municipal or hospital effluent, the concentrations and the types of antibiotics can shift. On the top right-hand side, I'm showing you an image of a confined animal feeding operation. So this is where we have a lot of animals in a small footprint and ultimately results in needing a lot of antibiotics to maintain these animals healthy. And a lot of the excreted uh, material, the waste is typically put into waste lagoons. And that's what you see on towards the top there, that pink pit there. And typically there's a lot of antibiotics present here. Um, often up to 90% of the antibiotics that are administered to animals come out as a parent compound. So while these systems are engineered to not leach and leak, they, they can sometimes. And if you're taking a close look at that image, you actually can see that this is flooded. So this is during a big flooding event um, in North Carolina. And, and during those events, uh, the, the waste is, it enters the environment very easily. Um, this is something that we need to consider a lot more thinking into the future with climate change and increase in flooding. In the bottom left is another image where we have uh, fish farming and also areas where we input uh, antibiotics as well for their health. And lastly, in the bottom right is just an image of uh, manure amendments into agricultural fields. And as I said, uh, this manure can 
have high concentrations of antibiotics. So when we think about all these antibiotics for all its intentional uses, uh, you can imagine that these antibiotics are entering the environment. Not only the antibiotics themselves, but even antibiotic resistant genes and bacteria can also enter the environment. And together, these two things have two effects, um, two general effects, one in human health and the other one in ecosystem function. And uh, what I really focus on is this idea of the ecosystem function. And this is what uh, my presentation here today is about the effects that these antibiotics have on ecosystem function. Specifically, I'm interested in understanding this uh, when we have the co-contamination of antibiotics and nitrate. Uh, so when you think about nitrate, it's a ubiquitous contaminant. And interestingly enough, it, it tends to coincide in similar areas where we have antibiotic contamination. There are plenty of lab studies that have shown us with many different conditions that nitrate reduction can be inhibited in the presence of antibiotics although some show that maybe it's not so much in certain conditions, uh, but overall it can be hindered. Uh, there's also field studies that although this is not directly considering these effects, do see, for example, in shallow groundwater uh, correlations or associations with high antibiotics and also high nitrate concentrations. But there really hasn't been uh, comprehensive studies to look at this in that aspect. When, when thinking about the lab studies in particular though, a lot of times these are done in well-mixed systems. And the reality is that in the environment, uh, what we have is, is gradients, diffusive gradients of these antibiotics that can develop or of these contaminants in general through uh, in contaminant plumes. And so my interest has been to really narrow in and look particularly at what's going on at the pore scale where we have these gradients of antibiotics or, or contaminants, stressors in general, and how bacteria are responding to them. And the specific question I'm trying to ask here today and that I focus my dissertation on is how do antibiotic concentration gradients affect non-target bacteria and their ability to reduce nitrate? And so in my dissertation, I broke this down into three specific areas. And the first aspect that I was considering, when you think about spatial heterogeneity, uh, you can assume that motility or the ability for bacteria to move around, in this case, particularly to swim around, can become important, right? They're not, they're not completely mixed in, this, in, a, in a homogenous space. It, everything's heterogeneous and motility can play a role. And at the same time, chemotaxis could also play a large role uh, where chemotaxis is, is the directed mo motility or movement towards a specific uh, substrate or nutrient, for example. The second aspect that I wanted to consider uh, was the effects of efflux pumps. Um, and if you're not familiar with efflux pumps, you can simply think of them as pumps that excrete or remove toxicity, for example, in this case, antibiotics from the inner membrane. So effectively reducing the effects uh, of antibiotic toxicity. And lastly, I was interested in looking at antibiotic degradation in these gradient systems as well. Um, and for the talk today, I'm really only gonna focus on the first two aspects, so motility and chemotaxis, and also antibiotic efflux pumps. And I will say that some of the, these objectives came about um, not only from, from literature, but also from observations as I, uh, as I conducted these experiments as well. So to start off with the first idea of motility and chemotaxis, we laid out two somewhat specific hypotheses of how we thought this, uh, these bacteria would behave in these systems. And we thought independent of underlying mechanisms and underlying mechanisms being, for example, efflux pumps, we said that motility and chemotaxis are required uh, for bacteria to access and reduce nitrate in these toxic regions of an antibiotic gradient. And second, we thought that in order for this to happen, bacteria are gonna need to develop mutational resistance. They're not just gonna be able to get in these areas and utilize this. There has to be some underlying mechanism that's allowing them to do it. And the rationale for thinking this is from a, a pioneering study that came out in 2011 uh, by Zhang et al, where they, showed the importance of antibiotic gradients and how they exert selective pressures and how it can induce antibiotic resistance, specifically mutational resistance. And in this case, they used E. coli and, and it was very much a, a clinically geared study in this case, but they found that they were able, the E. coli was able to acquire resistance within 12 hours when they set up gradients and they used a microfluidic reactor in this case. So very small volumes, controlled inputs, and they attributed a lot of what they saw to the ability for cells to migrate within interconnected microenvironments. In this case, they were considering antibiotic resistance in human tissue, 
uh, but at the same time, in an environmental setting, we could consider similar aspects um, in porous saturated soils or uh, in porous groundwater, for example, where we have these inter we might have these interconnected microenvironments. Uh, this genome map here just shows that what they saw was four consistent mutations. I'm not going to go into the details right now that occurred over and over as they were uh, as they were conducting these experiments. To give you a better idea of, of what I mean of, with this antibiotic gradient and landscape that we see, another study by Bame et al. that came out in 2016 really illustrates this uh, very beautifully and, and uh, visually, where they set up several auger plates with increasing antibiotic concentrations. So for example, in this blue one here where they inoculate the system, there's no antibiotic. But as you migrate or as you move towards these higher plates, there's higher and higher concentrations of antibiotics. And so what this does is it creates a selective pressure where all bacteria start utilizing all the nutrients in this region, all the substrates, and ultimately it's depleted and there's competition for nutrients. But those that can develop random mutations have a greater advantage to migrate up that gradient and utilize nutrients in more uh, toxic regions, and that perpetuates itself. And so this is the idea of having uh, where antibiotic gradients can induce mutations. And on the right-hand side, this is just an image of, of their actual experiment, and you can see these subpopulations emerging over time as well. So we wanted to take this idea of antibiotic gradients and, and apply it into the environment. And so the way I did this and the way I addressed this was uh, by fabricating microfluidic reactors that were able to create diffusive gradients that could simulate, at least to some extent, this diffusive uh, transport in the environment and, and how bacteria might interact in these systems. Uh, the reactor I made uh, consists of two boundary channels. Uh, you could think of boundary channel one in this case behaving as a source for an antibiotic and this boundary channel two at the bottom behaving as a sink for an antibiotic. So you can imagine that steady state uh, we could have a linear concentration of the antibiotic over time if it's complete, if it's diffusion controlled. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip uh, this explaining really how I fabricated these reactors. But overall, it has over 800 wells that are all interconnected. Each well is about one nanoliter of fluid, or I guess exactly one nanoliter of fluid. And if you remember that first image I showed in the introduction slide, um, it's exactly one of those wells. So that was the scanning electron micros microscopy image of one of these wells. Overall, the whole system here is about one microliter of fluid. So we're working with very small volumes. One unique thing that we have near the boundaries or at, at the wells adjacent to these boundaries is that we create small nanoporous barriers that are only about 200 nanometers deep. And what this allows us to do is to control the diffusive transport of solutes into the system and out of it as well. But we prevent cell washout in, in, the, in the hexagonal well array that's in the center of this reactor. Overall, the reactors can look some, something like this, where we have syringe pumps that control the flow, and we have uh, sterile vessels to collect the effluent. We put it all under an inverted microscope so we can image everything at all times. I think this is one of the beauties of microfluidics, where we can actually zoom in and see everything. Um, and we can actually look at various scales as well. Uh, the image on the bottom right here is just a picture I took of the reactor and you have a penny there for scale. So it's, it's about one to two by two centimeters, um, but the thickness of it is only 10 microns. So it's, it's very thin and that's why we have those low volumes. One of the first things I did when I, after fabricating and creating these reactors was to confirm that we do have diffusive transport, um, which is something I wanted to create. I wanted to create these gradients of the antibiotic. And in fact, uh, using the surface tracer test, we see that, that we do have that and that over time we can reach a steady state with it as well. And so with that, we, we moved forward and we started to consider uh, these experiments. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about several experiments and all have, they all have the same boundary conditions. So I'm going to illustrate them now here, where in boundary channel one, we have ciprofloxacin is the antibiotic we used at 50 times the MIC, which MIC stands for the minimum inhibitory concentration. And we use this MIC as a marker, uh, kind of an initial marker to, to, to determine what concentrations to use. Typically these MICs, uh, 1x MIC would be an enough antibiotic that inhibits the growth for 24 hours at an inoculation of 10 to the 6 cells per mil. We also add our substrates, in this case nitrate. I'm interested in, like I said, nitrate reduction. And we had lactate as our electron donor and carbon source. On the second boundary, we also have lactate and nitrate, 
but we don't add the antibiotic. So we can create that gradient. And we inoculate the systems with about 10 to the six cells per mil, which is equivalent to one cell per well. And we add a little bit of the nitrogen and lactate to stimulate initial growth in the system. And throughout the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about experiments that we ran with Schuonella densis, which is a, an environmentally relevant microbe uh, and different strains of it to try to understand how bacteria are responding in the system. And we also chose Schuonella for one particular reason. It's the fact that it undergoes uh, ammonification. So it reduces nitrate to nitrite and ultimately to ammonium rather than nitrogen gas. And the reason for doing this is that uh, we didn't want any gas production in these systems. It's all impermeable. So any gas production was would stay in the system and, and basically uh, destroy the, the solute transport characteristics that we've developed. Um, so that's one of the reasons also why we chose this bacteria to start with. So one of the first experiments we ran was using the wild type strain. So just no, just the, the standard strain of Schuonella and Adensis as is. And we put it in this reactor with the boundary conditions I just showed. And we tracked the this, this cell concentrations the, over time across the reactor across the gradient of formation or parallel to the gradient of formation. And one of the things we see right away is that even within six hours, and this is a well near right near the boundary of the antibiotic. So adjacent, just microns adjacent to that 50 X MIC. So a very toxic region. We see that bacteria are able to start to accumulate and increase their cell density over time. In the non-toxic boundary, we also see accumulation of cell density. And this is somewhat of a control to some extent uh, where we see uh, the cells behaving how they normally might behave in this with these uh, conditions that I present. Something that you see is that the cells are elongated. This is a stress response that they have. Um, I don't, I'm not going into that much in this presentation, but it's obviously something that you see right away. So I wanna make sure I mention it. Um, these cells are very active in these regions. This is an example, uh, a video of, of that region at 72 hours. And you see that these bacteria are highly motile and they're very active here. So it's not persister cells that are sitting around in these regions, they're, they're active. And, and as I'll show you, they're also metabolically active as well. Um, the way that I qualitatively measured uh, what these bacteria are doing in these systems, one way I said was to actually track the cell density profile. And I'm gonna show a series of slides that all look very similar to this one. Um, so I'm gonna explain this one. And after that, I think I'm just gonna point out specific aspects of each that are important. But I'm using, in this case, the wild type strain. We have nutrients on both boundaries. Row one represents the row of wells that are adjacent to that toxic boundary, which is also representative of row one here in the x-axis of this graph, the large graph I'm showing here and pointing to. And row 41 is representative of the wells that are adjacent to the non-toxic region. And, that's, and that correlates here to the well 41 in the x-axis of this graph. And then we have the cell density across it. So these are cell density profiles across the whole reactor. Basically, I average out a number of these wells um, for each of these, and I, and I take images of every single well along the gradient. And so we see again here that we have an increase in cell density in that toxic region. And obviously, we also have it in the non-toxic region. On the top, I just show a representative image at, in this case, 24 hours for each of these conditions, or for, uh, sorry, each of these wells uh, near the bound, near the toxic boundary, towards the center, and towards the non-toxic boundary. Okay, so when we did this, we thought, okay, this is really interesting. It's starting to look like the the effects that we're seeing in that pioneering study I showed initially. But when we would extract these cells, we found that there was no inheritable resistance, uh, which is which would be consistent with the development of mutations. We would extract these cells and, and conduct MIC tests and see that there was no resistance to ciprofloxacin, which was very interesting to us considering we see them for five days. I mean, and I failed to mention the legend, but this is every 24 hours are the measurements. And we see that they're consistently uh, inhabiting those toxic regions. But when we extract it, we see no resistance to it. And so um, we started to try to think of alternative hypothesis here. What's going on? We know that these bacteria are highly motile. They're, they can move about 67 microns per second, which is relatively fast. I mean, within one day, they easily get to one end of the reactor from the other if they want, if they if theoretically possible, I guess. And so we started wondering, is cell growth and migration from low toxic regions and motility what's allowing for this habitation and constant metabolic activity in those toxic regions? Um, so we did a number of experiments and I'm just gonna show some of the 
the, I guess the smoking guns or the results that really showed us the most. And one of the first things we did was looked at motility itself. So we basically plucked out the little flagella that allows the bacteria to swim around. And so when you inoculate a system with bacteria that are non-motile, they basically just stay in, the, in their perspective wells and they can't migrate across the system. And what we see here when we do this is that the cell density near those very toxic regions are representative of what we see in batch experiments. They're, they're not able to grow in these regions. That's what this is indicating. It's indicating that it's not growth, that possibly it's migration and growth from non-toxic regions or less toxic regions that's allowing for the accumulation. Beyond that, we wanted to show that maybe it's not just uh, the lack of motility, but that it's really chemotaxis um, that's allowing these bacteria to, to accumulate in these toxic regions and sustain metabolic activity. Uh, so what we did is instead of plucking out the, 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 the flagella, we just removed their ability to have, to sense uh, chemotaxis or to sense gradients of chemoattractants. So in this case, bacteria are able to move around but they're not really able to move around directionally. They just randomly migrate through the system. And we see a very similar response uh, as we see when we, when we remove motility. And so this leads us to, to, to say that it is motility and chemotaxis that is allowing these bacteria to sustain metabolic activity in these toxic regions. Now in this graph, we do see that it increases a little bit. And what we think is happening here is that overall, this is random motility and there is possibly some, some funneling that occurs due to the geometric shape that we have in the reactor that, that allows for some accumulation. But overall, it's very low. And we can see this uh, very effectively when we try to uh, measure nitrite production, which in our case is an indicator of metabolic activity. I keep talking about metabolic activity, but um, really all I had shown before was just these bacteria moving around. But here we see that we can look at the nitrite production rate per day in either boundary. So for the wild type in boundary channel one and boundary channel two, we see relatively high nitrite production rates. For the flagella mutant, we see very low or none at all in this case almost uh, in the toxic boundary, but high concentrations of nitrite in the non-toxic boundary. And similar effects for the, uh, for the key A mutant, which is in this case is the chemotactic mutant. So the one that can move around, but is really moving around randomly, non-directionally. And if we look at those cell densities near those wells adjacent to the end to, to boundary channel one, so near that row one that I was showing, we again see that it, it correlates. So high cell densities near that boundary, we have high nitrite production rates, and low cell densities, we have low nitrite production rates. Okay, so beyond this, we wanted to move on and consider it, it can't just be in our, we were imagining, it can't just be motility and chemotaxis. There has to be something else that's facilitating their ability to sustain uh, uh, these highly toxic concentrations of antibiotics. And so this is where the efflux pumps come in. And so our hypothesis here was that uh, the expression or overexpression of these efflux pumps, pumps is what's allowing them to, to, have, to inhabit these toxic regions. And the rationale for selecting these efflux pumps um, First, it's generally the efflux pumps in clinical settings are known to induce resistance. Um, but interestingly, Schuonella, the microbe I'm using, has uh, an efflux pump that is very similar, shares 72% identity with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And 72% identity is relatively high when we consider uh, these operons or these efflux pump systems. And the efflux pump in Pseudomonas is able to uh, excrete quinolones, fluoroquinolones, which are similar to ciprofloxacin. So that gave us kind of an idea that, that okay, the, the specific pump might, might be playing a specific role in resistance or uh, tolerance to, the, to ciprofloxacin. Um, we had another example where we created through culture-based methods a mutant. So we would transfer this mutant towards higher and higher concentrations. Not, not in a spatial concentration, but temporally, just every day we would add more and more antibiotic. And you can't believe how easy it is to actually make a mutant in that way. And we've made a mutant that was resistant to 50 XMIC, so 50 times that antibiotic concentration. And we, we did whole genome sequencing on this, uh, on this bacteria and we found three mutations that were highly relevant. One that makes a lot of sense that we see a lot of times, which is with specifically ciprofloxacin, which is a mutation in DNA gyrase. And this makes sense because uh, the antibiotic specifically targets the gyrase. So having a mutation in it 
uh, would aid the bacteria to, to be resistant to ciprofloxacin. But there were also other mutations related to, to mul multiple antibiotic resistant genes. And for example, specifically this MEX EF efflux pump, the one I'm specifically talking about that, we, that shares the same identity with, with Pseudomonas. And so uh, with this, this gave us enough, uh, it suggested to us that these, this pump might play a big role with ciprofloxacin resistant and potentially in our gradient system. Potentially they start to overexpress it in these toxic regions and it allows for their sustainability in those regions. So we made a mutant that was uh, in Schuonella that basically we removed this pump. So the pump is not effective anymore. And we did several tests to try to show that in, indeed this pump is important. Uh, initially, we did a simple MIC test um, uh, and we found that there was no effect. So in this case, the wild type and the mutant behave very similarly. The MICs were comparable, 39, 29 and 30. In, in this case, is uh, insignificant, the difference there. And so it seems that these pumps aren't intrinsically expressed, is what this shows, uh, when, when exposed to the antibiotic. But we did another test following previous literature, and we see that when we do a long extended assay, uh, we find that over time, uh, the mutant, if we have the wild type in the mutant with high antibiotic concentrations, this is this dark green and the purple here, uh, they are not able to grow for a certain time. And over time, the wild type is able to rebound. Okay, so it's able to rebound and gain cell densities that are similar or comparable to the wild type. And this is something that we did not see with, with, whoops, sorry, with the mutant strain. So the one that lacked this efflux pump was not able to rebound. And so this gave us confidence that, that this MEXF efflux pump is important specifically to ciprofloxacin. In this case, we tested two antibiotics, ciprofloxacin and chloramphenicol. Chloramphenicol was more to, uh, to justify uh, the results based on a previous paper and ciprofloxacin was the antibiotic we had initially, we used here, which wasn't tested before with Schuonella. And so we see that, that in fact, it is important, this pump is important, at least in, in batch conditions. So this is all under batch, this is not in the microfluidic reactor. And so now we wanted to put this in the, to the microfluidic reactor. So again, we have the same conditions, nutrients on both boundaries. And, and what we see here is not the result we expected. Um, I saw this a lot as I went through my PhD and I'm okay with it. But, but what we see is that in fact, uh, the efflux pumps don't seem to play a big role. Uh, there is a temporal variation um, with, a, with our resolution. It was really difficult to, to really narrow in on, on this specific aspect. But overall, if we just focus on the cell densities at the boundary, we see that again, uh, the bacteria is able to sustain metabolic or sustain cell, high cell densities in that region. And so we thought, okay, uh, if we remove one pump, uh, it might not be the best way to go about this because typically there are homologous pumps in, in bacteria that are able to compensate, for example, when you remove one of these pumps. And so uh, doing something that's called tiger fams, we can look at these annotations for similar pumps similar in specifically in this case, they're called resistant nodule cell division pumps. And we see that there's about four or five other areas, hypothetical proteins that could behave in a similar way as the MEX EF pump. Now, my expertise, I wasn't able to really narrow in and specifically target all these different pumps, but what we can do is try to, in some way, grasp all of them at once. And so what we can do is use something called efflux pumps inhibitors to try to inhibit the overall expression of pumps. Um, it, it's it's uh, shown to be effective in Pseudomonas and other strains. This is the first time we were looking at it in Schuonella, but we see with two particular efflux pump inhibiting compounds, uh, and I'll just say the acronyms, I don't think the names are important right now, but PA beta N and NMP, we see that when we add these compounds in the presence of the antibiotic, we're able to reduce the MIC of the, of the bacterial strain. And so effectively, the idea here is that we're reducing the intrinsic levels of expressions of these pumps, which would suggest that we're inhibiting the overall expression of these pumps. And uh, what, the, what these efflux pump inhibitors typically do is they basically just take the sites of the efflux pump. And so they start pumping out these efflux pump inhibitors rather than the antibiotic. And ultimately what this would result in is an accumulation of that antibiotic in the inner cell membrane. And so we went directly from this and put these 
efflux pump inhibitors in the reactor. We used it at, a, at the concentration where we saw it would reduce the MIC by 33%. We added it to both boundaries. So we added that efflux pump inhibitor throughout the reactor. And again, <coughs> we saw that, it, that in fact, it did not affect it again. Um, so again, the cell densities were relatively high in both boundaries. <coughs> My little dog is very excited right now. Hey, sit down. Um, one second, I'm so sorry. Someone very important is outside, it seems like. Um, my apologies. And so, again, we see that it didn't affect this. And uh, so the efflux pump inhibitors, again, didn't show that, that, uh, that they were important in, in, in sustaining cell activity in those toxic regions. And if we look at the nitrite production against once more, and this is comparing all of these experiments that I show, we see the wild type again that I showed previously, the flagella mutant, the chemotaxis mutant, the efflux pump mutant, and also the wild type with the addition of the efflux pump inhibitor. And we see that really the only cases where we saw that, that, it in, that we didn't have accumulation of, cell, of, of, the cell, of the cells and also the metabolic activity was when we removed uh, chemotaxis and motility, basically. So overall, what we see here is that spatial heterogeneity is allowing bacteria to survive and sustain metabolic activity in these highly toxic regions, something that we, want, we aren't able to really see in batch conditions. And it requires motility, chemotaxis, the cell migration, and it doesn't seem to require R&D flux pumps. I don't want to negate them completely because uh, I think I could go even further in, explain, in, in addressing this more refined, but just with the methods I show, uh, we see that, that they really were ineffective in, in, I don't, in, in any cases that I showed to, to be able to, uh, to enhance the survival in these regions. And we also didn't see any mutational or inheritor, inherited resistance develop. Uh, so currently, this, these results challenge uh, population dynamic models, because typically, when we think about these and these models that are presented, they consider the necessity for development of mutation antibiotic resistance as they migrate upgrading. And we're seeing here that other aspects can also contribute to this and that mutation resistance might not be necessary. In the case of, of antibiotics in the environment, and in particular in, in the way I show it here, this bodes well for nitrate depletion. So we're able to reduce nitrate, but we're not uh, increasing or, or causing antibiotic resistance in, in uh, in native bacteria in, uh, in these environments, for example, in agricultural settings, which is something that I was interested, that really drove the initial question that we had. Are we increasing antibiotic resistance in the environment just from the pollution of antibiotics? Not, um, not maybe not horizontal gene transfer or antibiotic resistant bacteria that come from, from the, for, for example, from excreted uh, manure and whatnot, but specifically in, in the native bacteria. And I think this work contributes broadly when we think about soil and water, like I said, in these agricultural settings. We can also start thinking about narrow spectrum antibiotics, uh, for example, that are in, in the rhizosphere, uh, the area, that close area between roots and microbes, where, where we do have a lot of antibiotics that are produced by bacteria naturally. Uh, so we can start considering these effects of these diffusive gradients and the importance of motility and chemotaxis uh, for population dynamics and community structure. And it also uh, indirectly correlates to those clinical setting effects that we see. Um, as I tried to correlate it again from, from a clinical setting to an environmental setting, I think we can also go from environmental settings to clinical settings as well. Uh, future work specifically to this, I would, I would say that... Um, Ray, you're way over time, so <laughs> okay. maybe you can talk about it in the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm at 32 minutes here. I apologize. So I, I will leave this as is. Thank you. Thank you. I think that we are way over time today. <laughs> it was an excellent talk and very interesting. So I, I can see how you were over time, but uh, we have to be considerate of the people that were here. And I think that we are open. We're going to open the, 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 the audience for questions. So you can ask questions to Ray and Lulu that I see that she has been answering a few of the questions in the chat. Uh, so just feel free to, to ask questions and maybe also more informal questions if you want. So 
if uh, you can raise your hand and I will call your name or you can, I have ready stuff. Okay, thank you. Uh, one comment is that if there's anything the faculty hate during the faculty interview is when people go over time. So that's a, probably a, a lesson learned here. Um, but I think both of you did a wonderful talks and I, I already asked uh, Lou for the questions I had. I have a question for Ronaldo. How do you, I, I'm not a microbiologist, but to me it appears that you have a cell density that is sort of pretty high close to the channel where you're injecting your toxic material and then it kind of drops off and it recovers and and this is the part that's confusing to me i thought they were going to all run away from the toxic material and go to channel 41 and and live there happily off ever after or something like that yeah I, I agree i think that's that was our initial thought kind of as i show those initial the landscape of the antibiotic in, in that Bain paper where they would migrate up that gradient and that they would want to stay in that non-toxic region. The, the thing is that in that non-toxic region, as cells accumulate, there's more competition there. But what we see is that that motility and chemotaxis are playing kind of a, a larger role in allowing this bacteria to migrate towards those toxic regions. And what we think is that what's happening and some results I don't show is that when we remove nutrients from that non-toxic region, the bacteria can't accumulate in the toxic region. So what we think it's a constant migration of cells from non-toxic regions towards these toxic regions. And also the, the fact that the cell densities accumulate in those toxic regions. Um, antibiotics, uh, the, resist, uh, the susceptibility to antibiotics is dependent on the concentration of cells. Um, that's something that, that is important here too, but something that, that we see occur specifically because of this gradient system and specifically because we have migration of the cells towards those regions. So I agree. I think in our initial hypothesis was, was not what we saw. And, and that's why we kind of deduce over and over and try to reevaluate the system over time. I hope that answers your question. Sure. You know, I, that's why I don't work with the bugs. I don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> <clears throat> So 